What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Today, we are in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, and I am happy to bring to you another awesome guest, and this is the one and only Dimitri. How do I pronounce your last name? Tukshar. Tushker. 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 Close enough. Wow, man. I just call you Dimitri. It <laughs> wasn't until now that I realized yeah. I've never actually said your last name out loud. I don't even know. I can't even say your last name. <laughs> Udezwe. 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 Easy. Close enough. Anyway, CEO of LGFG, Fashion House, Look Good, Feel Good. Introduce yourself to the people, man. Well, uh, I'm a CEO of a global fashion company with uh, sales and representative and representatives in over 20 countries. And I can go the boring route and kind of tell, you know, like I'm in the clothing and suit business. But the thing that everybody knows us for is we're the tailors to guys like Jordan Peterson, guys like Alice Cooper for the older audience, like Eddie Hall, uh, like Tommy Fury and Mr. Anatoly. We were with him today filming. You were there, too. So uh, we're really known online as a company that dresses uh, celebrities in, in excellent and outlandish suits. Awesome, man. When did you uh, start the company? So I started it in 2010. And, uh, you know, it wasn't like a... It wasn't like, okay, like, ah, I want to be in the suit business. I really was just a guy in my 20s that wanted to have a little bit more freedom in my life. And I really just made a list of things that were important to me. And those things included I wanted to be in sales, like because I had come from, from door-to-door encyclopedia sales for mm. six years. That's how I paid for school. That's how I bought my first uh, apartment in Vancouver. I was living in Canada. I wanted to be in sales. I wanted to do something cool that would help me meet girls because I was in my 20s. I'm like, you know, that has to be part of it. I was single. It has to be part of it. I want to meet a wife eventually. I got to look cool. I wanted something that would put me in front of influential and powerful people. Awesome. That was on my list. And then one other thing on my list is I wanted something to give me geographic freedom. I just have a very, from a fairly young age, I've had a fairly rational fear of government. Like, cause we, I grew up in Ukraine and the Soviet Union and we mm-hmm. sort of ran away from there. And so I've had this, you know, from my parents and all the different horrible things that happened in that part of the world and are still happening today in that part of the world um, and probably will continue to happen for a while, unfortunately. So I I got this rational fear of government. So I didn't want to sell something that I had to license locally that would keep me geographically locked in place. And crazy as paranoid as it was, it was a little bit um, fortuitous that I felt that way because Canada did change a lot. And eventually I did leave Canada. Canada. I live in Estonia now. Mm -hmm. Right. So that was like interesting how, how that fear actualized. And how much of that, you know, I created because I feared it. I don't know. But um, so so I wanted that. And I, I went down the list and it was like suits. At some point, it's like it just made sense. It like gave me access to very powerful people. Like today, you know, my last few weeks have just been insane. Like we're hanging out today. You know, we got a chance to meet, I guess, last year back in London yep. um, through the suit business. And I think you responded to that because you had seen that we were doing stuff for Jordan Peterson, who I connected to through the suit business. Mm-hmm. And, and then at the same time, you know, I was with Tommy Fury the evening after. And then, and then now I'm like, you know, we just deliver to, um, well, Eddie Hall's friend, um, Brian Shaw. Mm-hmm. And now we're doing some of the guys that you look up to maybe growing up, like Phil Heath. Awesome. Like, who's a guy that, that we're dressing right now, right? I hung out with him last month, actually. Is that right? I, I, I bumped into him randomly. Okay. I was in Arizona for the first time. Mm. And I just had a training session with my, my friend Steven. And we were like, oh, we just finished training. Let's, let's go get some breakfast. We go sit outside this place, and I'm just eating. And then I was like, I look up, and I see I see Phil Heath just on his phone at the table, three down from us. Like he's facing me, I'm facing him. We we actually follow we follow each other okay, online, okay. so we've chatted before, but we hadn't met in person. Mm. And it was just this funny serendipitous thing because he doesn't even live in Arizona either. Mm-hmm. He's based out in Flor in Florida. And I'd never been to Arizona before. And all three of us just sort of converged at this place at the same time. And then he came over to our table and we ended up just hanging out for like two hours and just chatting. I'm going to get him on my podcast. Awesome. As well. I'll text him after this because we were just texting about a suit. And yeah, Ronnie Coleman's on that list for us. And awesome. uh, it's just that was it. So like, you know, a lot of it was for me, like listing out things. And I remember the first time I sold a suit, if you're interested, like um, I, I was on the phone cold calling and I called a guy who was like this mega partner lawyer and I'm like 25 and you know I never been in a law firm before and this is like some massive massive guy I go into his office he opens this window in Vancouver looking the harbor overlooking the harbor and he's like that's my plane Mm. so this guy would fly his own seaplane to work every day that was my first client ever and I'm like I want to be in this business right and so it went from you know working very corporately we're like we're working with like a lot of law firms companies here like Aramco like oil companies where we're doing their suits and eventually it was like, well, let's cross that line and get into the celebrity stuff. And so I got onto the Rocks movie Skyscraper, mm. again, through just some good salesmanship. And um, it opened my horizons. And that's, uh, that's why I've stayed in it. Dude, that's awesome, man. There's so much we can get into, dude. Uh, tell me a little bit more about your, your background. You mentioned growing up in the Soviet Union. Yeah, sure. You mentioned living in Canada for some time. 
run us through that timeline. Yeah, so 92, the Soviet Union disbanded, Ukraine declares independence. Now, my grandfather, who had been a soldier his entire life, he has uh, three sisters who had all somehow escaped the Soviet Union after World War II. You know, and so we had family in Vancouver and New York, and then uh, we, we chose Vancouver. I don't know why, my parents and I. So we got on a plane. It was like a Tuesday. I, I went home from school, and on Wednesday morning, we're on an airplane leaving the USSR, Moscow to Montreal. And I'm like, I had no idea that we were leaving. I didn't tell any of my friends anything. I had no clue. And later, my parents told me, you know, we, don't, we didn't tell anybody because would, we would just get robbed and we wouldn't be able to leave. Mm. Like, you know, the Soviet Union it was dangerous. Like, this was the, like, this was like, the wild, wild west, man. You know, the Soviet Union's disbanding. The oligarchs are, are just taking over the country. There's mafia everywhere. Mm. And you just don't tell people if you're leaving because then they're going to rob you. Like, we had a VCR in the USSR with some knockoff. You know, we had like a Terminator 1 video cassette kind of thing. Like, that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and so when you have a VCR in the Soviet Union, because my grandma had smuggled one in somehow, uh, you hide it. Like you, when people come over, you take the VCR off the TV mm -hmm. and you slide it under the bed. Like nobody should know that you have a, a VCR because it's going to raise a lot of questions from government. It's the USSR and people are going to want to steal it from you. Wow. And, so, and so we left, we came to Canada. So I grew up in Canada and I lived most of my life in Vancouver. And then uh, when I started the business, I, I moved to Calgary. Um, and, and maintain offices. You know, I, I started opening offices across Canada. Eventually, we got into Paris, which was like 2013. We opened our first office in, in, in France. And that was just randomly because one of my friends, because the way you grow a company is you don't know what the hell you're doing, mm -hmm. right? And I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I knew how to sell, like I learned how to sell. I knew the products. But what happened was I was posting some of my stories on Facebook. And my friends were like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, you're 25 and you just met like the captain of the, of the NHL team. And, <laughs> like, and the newspaper wrote an article about the suits that the captain of the NHL team wears. And it was my suits. And they mentioned me. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? I'm like, bro, I'm literally like doing three things. I cold call on the phone. I approach men on the street. That's, that's how I sold a lot of suits. I would just see a guy in a suit. I would go on the street for like eight hours, just roam the streets approaching I him. love that. You know, so it's really funny because now you have on social these guys that like approach women. Yeah. And I have this joke that like, you know, they see a cute girl and they go up and talk to her. I see a fat guy, I'm salivating. <laughs> like, oh, that guy needs custom baby. Like he can't buy suits, right? So I just approach yeah. dudes all the time. And some of my biggest clients, I would literally, like I would see them in line at, at Starbucks. I would get in line at Starbucks. And I would start, just start a conversation and be like, oh, that's a cool suit. What do you do? I'm like, oh, that's what I do professionally. I'm a suit guy. Do you have a card? You know, mm. let's, let's change cards. So really it was like a lot of like that really old school Wolf of Wall Street type of stuff. And the third thing I did is I would ride up and down elevator buildings and just knock on doors. Like, wow. hey, I see you guys have an office here. What is, I've been banned from like every freaking building in, in Canada, right? <laughs> but what happened was, you know, I'm, I'm a couple of years into the business and my friends are noticing that I'm meeting successful people because mm -hmm. I built a, a several thousand clients doing that. Yeah. And they see I'm driving a Maserati and I'm still in my you know early 20s. And they're like, how the hell do you do this? I'm like, I can teach you. Mm. I'm like, I can teach you how to cold call. I'm the very old school kind of guy. This uh, social media was completely a different realm for me. Yeah. And then my friends uh, like, well, teach me. Like, I hate my job. Can you teach me how to do yours? I guess I can. And I started just training my friends. Like, it was literally in my apartment, like Wolf of Wall Street style. We got like phones. We would be on speaker all listening to the call, how to handle that objection and stuff. So when Wolf of Wall Street came out years later, we're watching. It's like, dude, that's us. And then we did it. it you know, it happened to work in Canada. It worked in France. It worked in Norway. It worked in Sweden. It worked in Finland and et cetera, et cetera. And eventually in uh, 2015, I had a girlfriend and, and I had known her before the business. When I started the company, we were already together. And then she wanted to work as well, doing what I do. So I taught her how to do it. So she became a stud salesman. And then we decided we're going to get married and have kids. And in 2015, we uh, exited Canada and we moved to Estonia and continue to run the company from there. So we're in Dubai right now. We have an office here at Sukal Bahar. You've met our, our staff. Mm -hmm. you know, we have our biggest office, oddly, in Hong Kong. That's our biggest sales office. Okay. And so we have offices all over the world and we're visiting you know, all the law firms, all the investment banks, all these kind of things. And, and my job is even better than that now. I get to hang out with, with people that are uh, famous like that's you. That's awesome, man, dude. That that that's an awesome story, and I love the fact that you just did the on foot street hustle. Yeah, uh, so I, did you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I did that for over a decade. I used to just be out there traveling all over the UK, so selling my CDs out of my backpack, as you said, going up to complete strangers, talking to people, putting you know, giving them my headphones, showing them my CDs, letting them hear the tracks, and yeah, I sold uh, you know over thirty thousand albums in the UK <laughs> doing that. I mean, wow. when I tell people I've spoken to over half a million people in real life, yeah they don't believe me. They think I'm exaggerating or I'm talking about online or I'm throwing out. I'm like, no, before you'd even heard about me online, Twitter, YouTube, any of the stuff that people may know me for now, I was just out there every day mm. just 
finding the pedestrianized high street in whichever city I was in. And not even just in the UK. I had sold, I'd, I'd gone to Berlin once to sell CDs. Mm. I'd been to Budapest out there selling CDs. And um, man, there's something, there's a lot to be said for that because no one, almost no one does that anymore. Now that the internet and social media are awesome and that's mm. something that mm. both of us use. But I think that when you've been out there and you've done it face to face and you've yeah. faced the rejection and you've talked to all sorts of people, different ages, male, female, individuals, groups, whatever, you develop a way of communicating and relating to people that is extru- is really rare. Mm. It's really rare. I think a lot of people now when they say they're hustling – they're, you know, they're emailing and they're sending DMs and they're, you know, they're online. That's not hustling. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, like, you know, it, it's it's work. But I'm like, man, it, if you go out there and you just stand on a street. Because of personal rejection. Watching. And it's, uh, you know, it's easier now than ever. And this is some people, oh, cold calling is that. No, it's easier than ever because there's less competent competition. Mm-hmm. There's less competition and less of the competition is competent. Mm. So, like, now if you're a good salesperson, you'll make a fortune. Because nobody's afraid, nobody's doing the phone thing. Like people yes. are afraid. They're like, oh, I'm going to send a million emails. It's like, yeah, you can get some good replies with a lot of emails. But if you're an effective salesperson, your conversion rate is way higher and companies will overcompensate you for that. Mm. Yeah. That's so interesting. And it's, it parallels into something that we, we were talking about earlier, which is even things like the dating market, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. With lots of young men and young women these days. I can't remember the number, but. I saw some stat, I take every stat with a grain of salt, especially if it's from a poll, but I saw something online quite recently saying that most Gen Z men, or maybe it was men under 25 or something, but have never approached a woman. It was 40% life. of men have never approached never, a woman. Yeah. And they're like, they've never come up to a girl and like just yeah. chat with her, get her number. They think it's insane. Yes, exactly. And I think it's weird. Um, <laughs> we had this conversation, like I met my wife in real life, yeah. which I think is probably we're the last generation mm. to experience that. Our podcast today is sponsored by The Wellness Company. Did you know that nearly 90% of pharmaceuticals in the U.S. are produced overseas? That's an alarming statistic. If you don't have an emergency kit on hand, it's time to get prepared. The Wellness Company's medical emergency kit contains eight potentially life-saving medications that every single American should keep in stock. It comes with a 22-page instruction guide on safe medical use for everything from snake bites to COVID to bioterror events. Another stellar product from the wellness company is Spike Support. Whether you got vaxxed or not, the virus is still among us in some capacity, as well as the related spike protein. Spike protein can cause brain fog, tissue damage, blood clots, and more. Spike Support is a detoxification powerhouse that aims to strengthen the body's natural immunity and flush out spike protein, so you can get back to that pre-COVID feeling. Get both of these products by going to twc.health forward slash Zuby and get 15% off with the discount code Zuby. That's twc.health forward slash Zuby and use discount code Zuby to get 15% off. Disclosure, the medical emergency kit is only available to U.S. residents. Has your, how old are you now? I'm 40. You're 40. Yeah. So I think that's such an interesting age to be at Mm. because you slash we, I'm 37, we are the last generation that has seen both sides. So you remember what the world was like before the internet, before social media, before smartphones, all these things that have become so ubiquitous in any developed society, even developed in developing countries, you've essentially lived half your life yeah, before it good point. and then another half after. And from now onwards, if you talk to someone who's, let's say, 25 or younger, they have no recollection yeah. of the world before those things and they struggle to even understand how things were done. We remember when, I mean, just go back 20 years ago, even 15 years ago, if someone said that they met their girlfriend or boyfriend or spouse online. It was, it was you don't talk it, about it. it you yeah, lie. You it just was, lie. Yeah, it's like, no, it we met weird. in a bar. It's like, yeah. come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was weird. Internet yeah. dating was weird. Um, you were looked at as like sort of weird or outcast if you did that. And in under 20 years, that's now the main way mm-hmm. that people are meeting each other. And people have even lost the skill not just to go out in person and talk to people, but even just to pick up a phone and call someone. You talk to a lot of young people, they've never phoned someone before. Jeez. They don't call, they, yeah. they, they just text. Well, and my daughter, like she's nine, she leaves me these little voice memos now. Like I can just call her, <laughs> but she just prefers to leave the memo and then just do, re- listen to it and respond in her time. Yeah, It's actually interesting you say that because it, one of the key skills in like sales and probably romantic dating is gonna be the ability to banter and mm-hmm. to like, you know, to kind of test each other's boundaries. 
and to kind of make little jokes and just kind of scope each other out, right? But that takes like a certain amount of skill to do it in the moment. Yes. Like it has to be fluid intelligence, right? But now you have time to prepare and think through your answer mm-hmm. and you still write something stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, dude, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's a totally different form of communication, mm. right? The way we're talking now, it's, I mean, jo- Jordan Peterson talks about this. He, he compares it like to a dance, mm. right? Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah, because yeah. there's... It's it's fluid. You have to know you're reading each other all the time. We don't we don't think of it overly consciously, but we recognize you know when do I pause and allow you to talk? When, when do you not interrupt? And then there's certain times where it's okay to interrupt. There's certain and the the only way you can really discover that is by having a lot of conversations with people in the real world and talking. I find that even when I do podcasts, I majority of podcasts I do are remote. Mm. just because I travel so much, but I really enjoy doing ones face to face like this because even that, that split second, that quarter of a second delay when you're recording online, Mm. just that tiny delay throws it off. Yeah. It, it throws it off. You find you, you, you talk over each other or you get awkward pauses because you know what I think is, I'll tell you something really interesting that you say that because I've thought about it a lot. So there's definitely a different exchange of energy in person. I teach my salespeople this because we can also sell remotely. Like, my salespeople will go to clients' houses and offices, but once we have their measurements, a lot of clients are like, let's just meet on Zoom, we'll pick out some clothes. Yeah. And we notice that the transaction size is always bigger in person than on Zoom. It's not even close. So mm. we always try to push up the pyramid from email to phone, because phone is better than email, because you can hear the guy, from phone to Zoom, because face-to-face is better than no face-to-face to person-to-person. And so why is there a different energy exchange? I think it's a biological thing. I think it's a disease thing. Meaning that the reason that you know you wouldn't, you wouldn't be allowed, like if your tribe, like growing up, you know, growing up, going back, you know, uh, 10,000, 12,000 years, if your tribe um, castigated you and you were no longer in your tribe and another tribe finds you, they would just kill you, mm-hmm. right? Because your presence would be a threat to the other tribe because you would be seen as somebody potentially disgusting. Like you would bring a disease that would kill mm-hmm. you. You understand like when Columbus came to North America, obviously a lot of the natives died just because they brought like syphilis with them yeah. and it just killed everyone. There's just nothing to like to prime them for that, right? Mm-hmm. And so... The reason that I think face-to-face works better on an energy level, it's maybe there's a delay aspect, like you said, yeah. but I think it's, it just fundamentally tells us subconsciously that the fact that we can be in the same presence and not die is that we're disease-free to each other. Mm. And I, th- I really think it's that primitive. I think that's where it comes from. That's interesting. I've yeah. never even thought that's, of it. That's why that I really like, you know, like I tell my guys, it's like, you know, we, we've had this experiment in our company where like you call somebody on the phone and they reject you. Yeah. I'm like, just show up at his office. Like what? I'm just show up at his, like, I want to sell to the CEO. Just show up at his office and shake his hand. Yeah. Okay. So they show up. It's like, yeah, I think we talked. Like, I'm Dimitri. You know, you shake hands and then you walk away and they're like, yeah, I just called the guy back and he bought like $10,000 of suits. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, well, there's obviously the trust factor that you met him face to face, but right. I think there's a primitive factor in your like crocodile, your your like lizard brain, yeah. you know, that fundamental layer that told the guy that you are safe to deal with because you were in the same proximity and both of you are still alive. Mm. I think there's just there's so many elements of human communication. Mm. And as you said, as you deviate from in person, you increasingly lose some of those dynamics, right? And some of it is some of it is a bit obvious, and I think a lot of it is sort of subtle and perhaps even metaphysical, right? So if you're meeting and connecting in person, you have every element. You have real time. You have tonality. You have body language. Smell. You have smell. You have you have touch. I smell great. Yeah. I'm just saying. I'm but just you, saying. Yeah, but you you have everything. You have you yeah. have phys- you have physical touch. You have the ability. You right. got the three D perception and awareness mm. you have the surroundings everything if you then go to say a zoom meeting okay you can still see each other and you can still see faces but now you miss most of the body language because you're mm. just seeing from here up you're missing the environment you're no longer in the same location mm. you've got that delay okay you've still got the tonality of the voice and so on then you deviate to email now that you've lost tone you can't hear, mm. you can't tell the difference between sarcasm and seriousness. You can't tell if something is being said as a joke or whatever it is. So, and then you move to something like Twitter, right? And now you, you, with each way, you're losing yeah. massive aspects of the communication. And, and if you think about it for all of humanity, yeah. <laughs> up until, what, 10, 20 years ago, pretty much everything was done, certainly a century ago, it's all been 
real world communication. Yeah. I mean, when was the telephone invented? Yeah, so that actually leads us to polarization, right? Because what happens is for whatever gaps we have in communication, like for example, your facial expressions mm -hmm. and just your hostility or, or acceptance of a matter, yeah. if we don't have that filled in for us, we just assume. Yes, exactly. And normally we just start assuming the worst. And so you see the polarization, right? That's, this is the problem yeah. with, with Twitter or X. Mm. This, is the, this is the biggest problem with social media. It's why people are so much more hostile mm. and nasty towards each other because number one, people forget they're talking to another human being. Um, it's not, there's, there's no real, real time. There's no consequences for bad behavior. Mm. You can't understand tonality. I've had situations where someone thinks I'm mad or someone thinks I'm upset or like I'm, I wrote something with a smile on my face and, and happy yeah. and the way they read it, they think, uh, you know, I'm aggressing towards them or that I'm, I'm like, no, no, there's no, I'm not, this isn't like aggressive at all. I'm just, you know, or, or I say something as a joke and someone takes it. I'm sure if I said it to them in real world, yeah. it would be super obvious I'm joking. There, well, you know, right? it's interesting. But they read it and they're I, just I like, thought oh. about that topic because sometimes you go to a party and you do say something like a joke and then you realize people take it at face value yeah. because they're literally just low IQ people. No offense, but that's what happens. Okay. And you're like, oh, you don't understand sarcasm. I get it. I can't talk to you anymore, right? And I think one of the things that I noticed on social media, like I'm not influencing on social media, but I'm following and I'm seeing how people respond to things, right? Is that we're not modulating for the IQ of the audience. And reality yes. is like, if you're going into a room with like Joe Rogan, whom you know, and you, you Neil deGrasse Tyson's in there, whatever you think about him, you're in a very intelligent room where people understand nuance and subtlety mm -hmm. and people understand sarcasm and undertone is the massaging of the conversation. You can basically be unhinged. You can be yourself. But you know, I know, and I'm sure this happens to you. Like there are crowds where you go into, you get recognized and fans want to talk to you and you really have to modulate. Mm -hmm. You have to modulate because you understand you're not in the circle of the people that you know mm -hmm. and so the trust is lower so you can't really predict their reaction to some pretty sedimentary things do you know what's great yeah is actually i don't get that too much okay because the people who know me and compose my audience if someone is to recognize me in the real world and come up to me and start a conversation there's a 95 percent plus so they chance actually that follow actually you and they know you. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly yeah, because sense, yeah. of the type of content i put out there Fine. yeah they're someone who for lack of a better term gets it yeah so actually i don't need to think oh do i need to really sort of dumb it down or worry that they'll miss I'm like if you've been following me on twitter for a while or listening to my but, podcast but, but i'm sure in real life you would have had that problem growing up because like i know you and i know that you underplay your intelligence like you're a computer science <laughs> graduate with an oxford degree right yeah and you worked at accenture so like i understand where you fit in yeah. but i'm sure that at some point in your life you're like oh crap oh, i really sure. i see this a lot with like very beautiful women like because i'm in sales so i see how it works and like and uh, there was like some very beautiful women in the company that would sell a lot. And, and a lot of salespeople assume it's because they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that gives them a few extra seconds to prove their case. But when I follow them, I see that they really dumb themselves down with clients. And I ask, like, is that intentional? Like, yeah, I do it intentionally because there's certain benefits to it. I'm like, that's interesting. And I start following like very, very successful, smart people. Mm -hmm. And I understand that there's like, if you cross a certain threshold with the wrong people, the, uh, there's an escalation for violence. Like mm -hmm. there's a propensity for violence, you know, because as men, for example, we tease each other all the time. Yeah. Like, you know, we'll work out and, and, and you know, why do we do it? Like the way that brothers bond, right? Yeah. Is we just call each other all sorts of nasty names. <laughs> but, but it's a way for us to test our boundaries to see if we're safe with each other. Yes. That's all it is. Because if I can do that to you and you don't become hostile, I know you're cool, you know, I'm cool. Yeah. And it's like, boom, we're bros, you know what I mean? And this is a tactic we use in sales all the time. I'm like, I'm like, make a little joke to your client just to kind of see how they respond. And if they respond, respond warmly you've reduced the threat of violence and now you can become a, a more bonded person and, you know, and this is business it's just standard stuff and i just realized that like and i've spent enough time with enough people that are really really successful that they do modulate and one of the things i learned very recently is um, my video guy and i we were in, uh, in la we were with michael franzese you know the former the former yeah, yeah. crime boss and first of all brilliant intelligent wonderful warm human being and he was telling us about this thing they did in the mafia called a sit down. Have you heard about this? I love this. So the whole thing with the mafia, it's like if you have a problem, somebody needs to get whacked, somebody's crossing over, somebody's stealing somebody's soldiers, whatever, is you meet face to face. And it has to be done face to face. And no decisions or actions are taken until you sit down face to face. And that's it. And when you meet face to face, you get the full interaction, you get the conversation. And I've said this to my guys, one of our company mantras, like we have a list of like say corporate rules that we follow. One of our mantras, one of our top mantras is we don't ever solve problems over email. Mm. That's it. Do not hide behind the screen. Yes. So for example, during the pandemic, like when, when things started getting locked down, obviously it impacted our company. And I called the chairman of our manufacturing company that we're a part owner of. And I called him up and he's like 65, 66 years old. One of the biggest guys in the industry. He's a wise man. Mm -hmm. And his name is Simon. I said, Simon, uh, you know, we're going to have to do some cutbacks here, man, because, you know, as a suit selling company during the pandemic, we're just not going to be selling a ton of suits. We actually made out pretty well because we had to change some stuff. 
And Simon's like, Dimitri, the, I, I don't know how this is going to play out. I don't know what's going to happen. But the one thing I think you should really, really try to do, like if I can give you some, some, some sagacious advice, you know, he's like, don't hide behind the screen right now. You're the CEO of the company. Get on video calls with, you know, you can't travel. Get on video calls with people. It's the best you got. Yeah. And so I, I just called people. I said, hey, and I, and I called each of our top salespeople that had access to all the other people in the company. It was about 15, 20 calls for me. Mm -hmm. And I had a conversation, and I spent the whole day just talking to all of them face to face. And I think it saved our company mm -hmm. because nobody left. Because they saw that I wasn't hiding behind the screen, that yeah. I was acknowledging the problem. And when Franzese told me about the whole sit down thing, I'm like, that's what it was. It was the fact that we were able to sit down because you know how people like in the in the people hate their jobs and a lot of times they hate their boss mm -hmm. and a lot of times because they make assumptions like the company's doing this and it's stupid and they're doing that and it's stupid and the reason they think that is because they don't communicate with the people who make the decisions yes. and so they don't see the scope of the entire decision because they're down here and somebody's up here and they see the whole view and so we don't get the scope of the conversation when we're not face to face as much as we can be right absolutely so so I love that so you know learn from the mafia do the sit down <laughs> <laughs> do the sit down. So tell me, I'm curious to know more about the the growth of your business. So you you started it in sorry, remind 2010. me 2010. 2010. 2010. You started it, which isn't really that that long ago in the grand scheme. Not, of things. not with how old we are. No. So how did you how did you scale it to the point where you're now in 20 different countries? Yeah. I mean, you talked about opening offices, but obviously there's a lot of stuff in between. Sure. Selling your first suit to a guy in Vancouver. Yeah. And then being at the stage you're you're at now, so just talk me talk us a little bit through the the process of how you actually did it. So I wish that there were some crazy secrets behind it, yeah. and there's no crazy secret. And that's actually really funny. So when I meet with a very successful person, I, I have this connecting a connecting question: How do I build rapport? Mm -hmm. And I can do it to you right now. So when I'm just like, so what was your shortcut to success? You know, and I kind of say that with a little bit of facetiousness behind the question. Yeah. You kind of, and you, and you almost, it's like funny, but it's sad funny. And you're almost like, oh my God, my shortcut, let me tell you. You know, <laughs> I went on the streets and sold CDs. That's my shortcut. There's no shortcut, right? Yeah. Um, my goal and my prerogative from the very start was very, very simple. I just wanted to be the best at what I do. Mm -hmm. Like, I just wanted to be the best at my job. And jo Jordan Peterson, again, impacted me on this because a couple of years later, he said something in one of his uh, lectures. It was like one of his like recorded old school U of T or Harvard lectures. So this was before he was mega viral. But I just enjoy the psychology content anyways. So this might have been back in like 2015 or 16. Mm -hmm. And he said that when you are really good at what you do and you say yes to a lot of things, invisible doors will open. Mm -hmm. So when you're really, really successful, you learn to say no to a lot of things. But that's an arrogant position to take when you're not very successful. So I teach my guys in my company, I'm like, say yes to a lot of things. Like, say yes to free work. Like, well, you're not paying me for my time. Yes, because I'm not a communist. Yes. And that's one of our company's mantras. We don't pay for time, we pay for outcome. Mm -hmm. We pay really well for outcome. Does that make sense? Yes. And that's how the world really operates. Like, nobody's gonna pay you for your time in the gym. But you get rewarded really well for the outcome. Like you live longer, you look better, you feel better. Uh, you're just generally ha healthier so you can focus on other pursuits. People respect you more. There's a lot of benefits for time that nobody paid you for. Yes. But today's generation, you know, the leftist mindset, we're like, no, somebody needs to pay for your time. Mm. It's like, well, if I'm paying you for your time, then you're probably not worth a lot because I can buy time a lot of places. Yes. So the mantra was like, just be the best at what I do. And it's really like, I really, really took a lot of pride in that. You know, we we're talking like about working out with Eddie Hall and he's, doing 380 kilogram <laughs> deadlifts as training, right? Or we were with Mr. Anatoly today and he's doing crazy stuff at the gym, right? Because that's the thing he wanted to maximize for. He needs to be the best at that to have the best possible content that he creates for that, right? My thing was like, I'm a sales guy, I'm a salesman and I like being a salesman. I enjoy, the, like I like Ayn Rand, like I like free market capitalism. I'm a capitalist maximalist, I don't care. Like I grew up in the Soviet Union, I've seen the other side, I take no shame in maximizing my market value. And the market decides my value, not some boss, right? And so what do I have to be the best at? I'm like, I wanted to be the best on the phone. Like I wanted, when I make a, like I really, like this was not something that I took like, like when I made a cold call, like, and you pick up the phone and you're in a room and there's women in the room, by the time you hang up the phone, I have your wallet and every woman on the floor is pregnant. <laughs> because my friend, when you pick up the phone and you have me on speaker, I am laying my seed, you know? Like, like I would say it's all like, if I cold called you in 2011, okay, you're going to be an old ass man in 2070 and you're going to be on your deathbed and you're, and you're going to be asked by your grandkids, grandpa, do you have any regrets? And you're going to be like one day in 2011, a salesman named Dimitri cold called me and I didn't buy. And I think about that cold call every day. 
And that's my number one regret is I really wanted to meet the greatest salesman <laughs> in the world. <laughs> like that's how good it has to be, yeah. right? So I played these scenarios in my head. So I wanted to be, and I said, I'm gonna be the best cold caller in my city. Eventually I got to the point where I got really, really proficient in that. Then I'm like, I wanna be the best cold caller in the country and eventually the world. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, I, and I showed that, like we have a company uh, videos we record where earlier on, like I would land in like Norway I would pick up the call phone in my hotel room and just start calling a law firm in Norway. And like, just like I can book those damn meetings. I learned how to do it. And so it was just becoming really good at my craft. So like, what's the secret, man? It's like, okay, well, let's say Stephen, uh, you know who it was? Um, Steve Martin, the comedian. Yes. He had this really wonderful thing, like this great speech I saw once where he like goes to a party and people are like, yeah, I want to be a comedian. I'm doing my headshots. I'm doing my agents, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, but are you funny? Like, why are you working on all the marketing stuff? Are you actually funny? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so for me, it was like, that, and I, that impacted me very much. I'm like, am I really, really that good at the thing that I do? I don't need to be good. Like, I, I went to school, like business school. Like, I think you did MIS or computer science. I did MIS or so business yeah. and computer science, you know? So like, but I knew I wasn't going to be a programmer. Yeah. Like, I understood the fundamentals and the basics, but that wasn't the thing I was maximizing for. For me, I was a salesman. I was maximizing for salesmanship. Now, my chief information officer is a brilliant uh, uh, data architect. Okay. He's so good. at It's crazy the stuff he's built for us. I'll show you some stuff later. Literally blow your mind. And like, it's crazy, like what we've done, but that's, he maximizes for being the best data architect project manager. And he's just so deeply entrenched into his field. Mm -hmm. He's the best, like my lawyer, like, like, like my labor lawyer in Toronto. He's so passionate about labor law. It's almost insane to me. My tax lawyer in Canada, he literally, I'm not even making up, carries the Canadian tax code with him everywhere he goes. He's obsessed with it. I was obsessed with my business. I wanted to be the best at selling. I wanted to be the best at suits. Like sales is a skill, but you want to attach it to a product and become an industry expert. You don't want to be an expert at everything because you're an expert at nothing, right? So, so I really, really wanted to do that. And once I started to become really good at it, I could teach other people to do it. And how do you scale anything? You either teach people how to do it or you hire people that are better than you and you watch the outcome and you watch the results. So I hired like some people early on that were like literally just friends of mine from Facebook to go out and sell suits. And they're like, how am I going to train? I'm like, you're going to follow me for a few months. So what are you going to do? You're going to see me approaching men on the street. You're going to see me cold calling. You're going to see me walk into offices and getting business cards. And then you're going to do the same. And, and you're going to learn. It's going to suck, but you're going to do the same. And so, you know, I took a guy out in Toronto, Chenda. He now runs our Hong Kong office. He's a partner in our company. He started this 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. What did we do? We sat in Dunkin' Donuts in Toronto. We cold called. We approached people on the street. He built a business in Toronto. He moved to Hong Kong. He knew how to do it. He opened an office for us in Hong Kong as our brand grew. And, and, and so... We cascade that, we, we, it's a fractal that moves down through the organization, right? Like you build that culture of this is what we do to be successful. And by the way, like you don't need, and we have an amazing product, like of course, like the most famous people in the world wear our product. Mm -hmm. But it's not a product argument per se, it's a competitive advantage argument. Like what do you do better than nobody else is willing to do? And in my case, because I didn't think I was very creative, the thing we did better that nobody else was willing to do was we were able, or willing to do things nobody was willing to do. Mm -hmm. Like nobody wanted to join a suit company that you have to approach men on the street. Yeah. But, we were, but if you don't want to do that, you're not going to fit with us. That's our culture. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to cold call 10 hours a day, but we did it. And people are like, well, how did you do all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, you just do stuff you don't like and you learn to love it. Yeah, yeah. Like nobody likes training. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I like, like I, what's that? You might <laughs> I like, said training. I like training. Yeah, but listen, like, I know Lennox Lewis, yeah. and I've talked to him about this. I'm like, Lennox, did you love training camp? He's like, really? Did I love leaving my family for two months and being completely inaccessible to the rest of the world and getting up at four in the morning going for a five mile run? Did I love that, really? Yeah. But that's what you do to win. Yeah. And, and maybe I'm sounding like an old guy here, but like, yeah, maybe our generation doesn't have a ton of that, which is why I turned to social media. Like, I, I turned to social media to recruit salespeople a few years ago, and that's where we get we get 600 applicants a month now. They're all from wow. Instagram and TikTok. Interesting. Because we can't get that at universities anymore. Mm. Because the ones coming out of university, they feel like, well, you know, I have an international relations degree, so I should just be a vice president. Yeah, a vice, You know nothing. Yeah. Right? Like, 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 I don't determine your value. The market does, right? You know nothing. So... Yeah, I mean, you were looking for the secret, like, how do we build this amazing brand? It's like, yeah, well, we're competing against Prada and Gucci and Canali, mm -hmm. and they're in all the stores in the world, and we're competing for the same client and the same money. Mm. Well, our distribution is something that those guys aren't willing to do. You don't see a Canali salesman approaching men on the street. We did that, and we built a brand out of it. I love that, man. It, I, I love sales. I actually really, really like sales. And it's funny because I think sales is something that's really misunderstood. I think when people hear the word sales or they hear the word salesman especially, they have this aversion or they have this idea of something being seedy or grifty or unethical or whatever. 
and yeah, of course, there can be people who are unethical in anything, but the idea that there's something wrong with sales itself is crazy because as far as I'm concerned, everyone is selling all the time. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't consider yourself a salesperson, I mean, it's funny because we had that little side conversation where we talked about, um, talked about relationships or approaching, approaching someone or trying to build rapport. It's all the same. It's all, it's all sales. When you're meeting a new person, if you're applying for a job and you've got an interview, that's sales. You're, you're, you're selling. If someone's dry, all these interactions, all these exchanges of attention, exchanges of influence, exchange of ideas, we're all selling. If you're debating, if you're arguing, if you're just having a conversation with people about ideas, you're in sales mode. You're trying to sell that person an idea. You're trying to change the way they think. You're trying to influence them in some way. They're trying to do the same. So we're all always doing this sort of sales dance back and forth with each other. And if the thing that you are actually selling, whether it's a product or it's a service, or even if it's just an idea, as long as it is something that is quality that will add a benefit or some type of value to someone's life, then it's not even just neutral. It's like, to me, it's good to sell. Right. If you are selling something that is good, if I have a good idea, if I have a program or a book or something that's going to help people be happier or help people get in better shape or help people take charge of their health, yeah. help people to look good, help people to feel good, whatever it is, then selling that is, is good. More people should have that. You know what? I've created this great thing. If, if th think of an extreme example. If someone created um, an actual, <laughs> someone created an actual cure to cancer right. that really worked, then it would be unethical for them to hide it away sure. and, to, and to sit on it and to not share it. It's like, no, go out there, promote it, market it, advertise it, sell like get it out, right. get it out to the people. So that, that's how I look at it. And that's actually how I always kept myself going with firstly when I was selling my stuff out on the streets for over a decade but even now whether I'm doing stuff on social media or I'm promoting my book or I'm yep. pushing my podcast or whatever I genuinely believe this conversation is going to help people when someone mm. sits and listens to this conversation we're having that can nudge them in a positive direction they can take some little nuggets from there understand the world a bit better maybe do better at their work do better with their business mm. whatever it is so I'm like cool it's my duty to try to make sure as many people hear this as possible. I'm not going to reach everybody, but if I can get this out to, you know, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 people, amazing. Amazing. That's awesome. Not because I just want to get some type of clout or build my own fame or whatever, but I'm like, cool, like this is genuinely helping people. I'll go further if go I may. Please do. Uh, sales is community building. Mm. Sales is society building. And here's why. So, so use the extreme example the opposite way. When somebody says, I don't like salespeople, I'm like, I have a great solution for you. Move to North Korea. There are no salespeople. <laughs> there's no salespeople in Venezuela or North Korea. Mm. Like communist countries don't have salespeople. Mm -hmm. Everything's provided by the government that tells you what is the best for you. Do you want that? Mm -hmm. Do you like that? And they're like, no. Well, then salespeople are necessary in society. Absolutely necessary, right? Number one. Number two, uh, salespeople promote free speech absolutism. Yes. Because the market chooses where and what to buy. And if you don't have salespeople, then you don't have marketing. And if you can't promote things to people, then who the hell is selling you stuff? It's going to get monopolistic, right? Mm -hmm. That's one of the problems we, you know, we kind of went through this pandemic situation, right? We're like, you were, you were silencing salespeople that were selling alternative viewpoints. Yes. And it didn't lead us down to a good place. Oh, nope. So salespeople, in a lot of ways, are society builders. And the third thing about salespeople is watch this. So here's how averse we are to salespeople and here's why we need them. We have no trust for anybody in our community that has not, not built a reputation. Example being, even when your friend sends you a YouTube video, the first thing you do is you check how long it is. Mm -hmm. That's how little trust we have for anybody with, right? Does that make sense? You're like, but that's your friend. You should watch what he sends you, but I'm still going to check how long it is and I'm going to decide if I'm going to watch it or not. Does that make sense? In order to succeed as a salesperson or a business person, you have to be a community builder. So I met a financial advisor. He was 26 years old and he was married. And I asked him at 26, why are you married? You're young, you're a good looking dude, you're very successful. He goes, because my clients wouldn't trust me if I'm a single 26 year old guy spending their money. Mm -hmm. So it puts a pressure on him as a salesman to be part of the community, to participate in nonprofit organization, to, to promote healthy community building causes. Mm -hmm. So salespeople, the ones that get ahead, they iterate in order to build the community and be a valuable member of their society. That's a good thing, right? You look at why the left hates salespeople. It's the left that hates salespeople, you know why? Because the left hates society. Because the left is like the inverse 
of, of, uh, of re- they're the inverse of religion, they're the inverse of salespeople. Here's how it works, right? What is religion? Religion is fundamentally like made for you to do things you don't like and to not do things you like that are bad for you, but essentially good for the community. Mm-hmm. Is that true? As a, if you're religious, if you're practicing these steps of whatever your religion is, you're probably not promiscuous because you're, 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 you're tells you not to be. You're not flagrantly, you know, arrogant because you're, you're, you know, you're not using God's name, God's name in vain. You are doing things that fundamentally limit the things that you're, you feel me may be entitled to, yes. but they're community building. Yeah. You following me? Yes, person. And then, and then look at the left. The left is all about, uh, ex- like it's all about expressing their individuality above all else, no matter how delusional it is. You can say you're a woman when you're not, yeah. and everybody has to believe you. And look what happens to the community at large. You destroy the community. I have a question. Yeah, because I'm I'm always careful about. I avoid using the terms the left and the right. Okay. Um, because for a lot of reasons, but when you say the left, what does that? Who are you? Who or what are you? To me, it's a, pers- it means a person that puts their own self-expression above the benefit of the community. That's all it is, and that's why okay. I love. That's why. I, so look, 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 look at look at like uh, communism, right? Like, mm-hmm. how does communism arrive? Uh, how does like how does a country get to communism, right? It's it's always a dictatorship because yeah. nobody actually wants it, but there's a small enough group of people that put their individual interests above the outcome for the community, and you know it's above the outcome of the Would community. It, to play devil's advocate, right. isn't this the criticisms that the left makes of the right? The right just wants freedom. The market decides. Yeah. Well, I don't know about the right or whatever, but but yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, what I'm is just saying, yeah, so the I, question is? I, I, I'm not yeah. saying I would like like. There's obviously extremes on both ends yeah. because at some point you get into dictatorships, right? Sure. But what is described today as the right is basically just the center. Okay. It's like I, don't, I look. Is it? Is it? So a, you're thinking more like perhaps more authoritarian, libertarian scale. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, that's a hundred percent correct. Yeah. But but generally speaking, it's like look, like so again, we're coming back to the sales argument. It's like. As a salesman, the market decides if I'm good at what I'm selling. The market decides if my product is good. And I have a significant social pressure uh, to do the right things. Like even today with Mr. Anatoly, he asked me if I wear a suit everywhere. Yeah. And I'm, actually, I used to. Like I used to live in an apartment building where I take my garbage out in a suit because I knew my clients lived in the building. Mm-hmm. So I want to promote myself as a member of the fashion community. right? I don't want to be caught not dressing up because I'm underselling my message. Yeah. Um, I want to show that I'm a good uh Husband to my wife, because if I mistreat my wife, then people are not going to trust how I'm going to treat them as a business partner. Yes. Does that make sense? Of course. Because we always look at how men treat the people around to see if they're safe to do business with. So sales and entrepreneurship promotes the building of community. Uh, now, if you're living in a communist regime, for example, and I use a kind of like, I can maybe conflate that with the left, maybe it's something else, you know, yeah. in different aspects. But like, there's actually not a lot of pressure to build uh, a good constructive uh, contribution to community other than the government will just kill you. Mm-hmm. But then the government gets to define what is good. And a lot of times you're not acting in your own self-interest because when you look at communist country, lower life expectancy, higher hunger rates, high, actually way lower standard of living, low innovation, low, low contribution scientifically to the world, right? Food supply shortages always happen, right? So it's like, so to me, sales was a moral decision. Like I wanted, I, I really was. And not only that, but I really, and this is maybe going too far, but it's complicit with my values. I really wanted to sell a physical product. Yes. Because then people can feel it and they know, and that was one of the things on my list. It has to be a physical product. Mm-hmm. And people can feel it and they can immediately compare it to other things. And then if I feel like if I'm winning in a transparent market, then I'm really winning. Because the market then says, hey man, you did good. And that makes me feel good. That's awesome, man. LGFG. <laughs> I wanted to shift gears a little bit. You've talked about your wife. I know that you're a family man. Four kids? Four kids. Is that right? You're correct. Tell me more about meeting your wife, first of all. And then how becoming a husband and then becoming a father has altered the way you do business, perceive the world, whatever it may be. Well, so first things first, like transparently, like I think like most men growing like through high school and then like college and stuff, you know, every guy has an experience that like some girl breaks your heart, yep. you realize you need to change. Yep. You, have, you don't have a choice. Like like the women, like to me, women are, are messengers to men to tell you how you're really doing in the world. Because mm. women will tell you how you're really doing. Yep. Right? It's that's what it's, that's it's like. like, it's like. It's just like God talking through women <laughs> telling you, hey man, <laughs> hey man, like be better. You're a broken game. Right? Yeah. yeah. Broken. <laughs> so, so, I, so I had a, an experience like that. And I think, um, and so for me, I, I also realized like I, I didn't know like, you know, and I'm not, I'm not claiming allegiance to any sort of religiosity because I, I was, I, I wouldn't call myself a person that's religious in any way at all. It was more like, it was more like this. It was like, okay, I definitely see myself in the future as being married and having kids, having kids. So that's the example my parents set forth yes. for me. The biggest benefit privilege I had in life was that my parents stayed together while I was in school. Yeah. That's the biggest privilege of all. Like we weren't, we were definitely not wealthy. We were definitely not socially connected to anybody. But because my parents are working class people, mm-hmm. but 
they were together. And so that's the model that I had to aspire to. That was the blueprint that was set yes. forth in me. However, I also realized like in the early 2000s, which was when I started kind of going out into the market and dating, that most women, at least the ones that I was supposed to, they weren't necessarily thinking like me. Like I thought women would be thinking I want a date to marry. Yeah. But then all the decisions I saw them making from kind of the outside is like they weren't making decisions that optimized them for marriage. Interesting. And this is in Canada. This is in Canada, right? This is already like, you know, Plenty of Fish was already a big thing. Okay. It was just before like the new dating apps, but, but people were starting to meet a lot, you know? And I'm like, and, and I started anecdotally noticing, which has now been empirically proven, and I'm, I'm glad that my observation was, was backed up by empirics because then it was the right thing to think, is that I noticed that women really were just maximizing for hypergamy. Mm-hmm. Like there were a few guys that I knew that got all the chicks, mm-hmm. and then there were a lot of guys that got none of the chicks. Mm-hmm. And, and you have two choices to make. It's what I learned from sales. Like you can either choose to be angry at the market or you can adapt to the market. Yes. So I wanted to maximize uh, my attractiveness to women. I'm not saying that in an arrogant way. Like I really wanted to learn how to maximize my attractiveness to women. Like that was the thing I thought about. So that means what? That means I have to, have, I have to get paid well mm-hmm. or learn to make money. Like you have to know money. I started going to the gym even though like nobody taught at the time it wasn't like a big thing on social media like how do I make how do I maximize my body mm-hmm. so um, and maybe I'm not not on a representation of that at the maximal level but it was it had to be at a, at a point where I was proud of myself yes. um, and I had to maximize my communication skills because you have to be able to you know communicate mm-hmm. and I actually signed up for courses on communication even though I was already in sales like I, I, I and these guys they were like they took me from selling door uh, door to door and on the street to men they taught me like back in like 2006 how to approach women on the street and compliment them and, and talk to them and get their number and I literally started doing that as a practice mm. and, I'm, and I'm proud of that like I'm unapologetic about it because it taught me how to maximize my attractiveness because I knew that long term I didn't want to I wanted to opt some optimize for a mate that actually fit my ideal. Yes. It was just a selfish way to look at it, but if I can do that, then I can also make my, my future wife happy. Of course. Like, wouldn't my wife want me to be charismatic? Wouldn't my wife want me to be attractive? Wouldn't my wife want me to be verbally agile? And, do you, you know? know something really funny? Is I've noticed over many years that women want men to be all of these things, but somehow society and even women themselves view it sort of weird or get uncomfortable if guys actually take steps to learn these things. Yes. Right. It's almost like it's just supposed to sort of happen by magic and you're not meant to learn about it or like put in an effort or whatever. There's this, there's this strange dichotomy there between what people want and what society kind of encourages or discourages. And it's strange, you know, if you say, yeah, I, I took a course or I read a book or something to help me become better at communicating or become better at this social skill or become more comfortable around women or whatever it is. You think of, you know, if you do any other type of training for like some hard skill, that's not frowned upon. That's encouraged. Like the whole school system, university system. It's like, you know, study this, study this, study this, study this. But then when it comes to actual communication, actually listening, talking, reading, writing, understanding people, reading body language, being socially calibrated, Mm -hmm. there's this sort of yeah, there's a wave of kind of discouragement of that type of behavior, which is very strange because actually right? it's it's weird because it, you see the same w- with women as well, right? Like women are not encouraged, young women in this day and age are not encouraged to become better, become a better person, right? Like think of, like you said, you you think, okay, what is it women actually right, want? Just, just what say, do, what say, do, say what you're thinking. Women yeah. are not taught to cook. Just say it. It's, oh, that wasn't even right at the right top. That wasn't even right at the top of my. That wasn't even right at the top of my brain. But yeah. just like men will think again. Not all men will do it. But okay, what what is it that women actually like and desire and respect and appreciate? Let me take steps to become that guy, mm. right? Mm. But a lot of younger women, and I think this is a relatively new thing, and maybe this is just the impact of feminism or whatever. But it's like. I'm perfect just the way as I am. Every man should just sort of take me the way I am. I shouldn't learn to manage my temper. I shouldn't learn to cook. I shouldn't learn to do anything useful. Right? If I'm perfect the way I am, I could be fat, right? You're fat. Like I'm body positivity, whatever. If a guy doesn't like me because I'm hundred pounds overweight, that's, that's his problem. That's society's problem, whatever. There's just this total lack of accountability. And the biggest problem with it all is actually it's causing a lot of damage. It's making it very hard for young men and young women in particular yeah. to find each other. You talk to men, what do yeah. you say? Oh, there's no good women out there. You talk to women, oh, there's no good men out there. And I'm like, this is interesting. You're both sort of saying the same thing and pointing the finger in both ways. But how about you all take some responsibility and accountability and try to be 
not just a better man or woman, but a, a better a better human being, right? Become more attractive, and lo and behold, you find that people are attracted to you. And I don't just mean that in the sexual sense. Right. I just mean like if you are a good man or a good woman, and you are competent and you're confident and you communicate well with people and you're friendly, what like the world will just open itself up to you because everywhere you go, no matter the city, no matter the country, online, offline, or whatever it is, you're just attracting people to mm. you all the time. I can go to any city. I can go to any country. You're the same. You can land anywhere in the world mm. and you can just attract people to you and connect people, bring people together, add value to everyone. People add value to you and you just enjoy the entire process. And actually, I want more people to experience that, mm. right? Like life has so much to offer. And if you really work on yourself and people see that you're doing something cool and that you are cool and that you're good and you're friendly and you're honest and you're humble and whatever, man, the world really opens up to you in a way I think most people don't even don't realize. Yeah, it's like what McConaughey says, don't chase butterflies, but build a better garden. <laughs> and um, I had a really funny conversation about that. So you said like, you know, women don't optimize for the market. I've learned more recently that men, unfortunately, are the same. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of women that are like body positivity. I'm going to be like this and you're still going to love me yes. and you should love yes. me. And it's like, well, the, <laughs> but, what's it, but, that, but that's the leftist thing about you know, schools that are teaching us right now. Again, it's you're putting your self-interest above society. Like society doesn't care what metrics you're judging yourself on. They're just going to judge you anyways. Mm -hmm. And then we just lie to each other and say it's great. But yes. we don't act and show that it's great because we don't want to force ourselves to for example to be attracted to somebody we're just not attracted to right and but and so i thought it was like i was watching some red pill stuff i'm like oh there's a, this problem with women and then i started getting a little more involved in the company interviews to kind of see what the guys that we were interviewing were like and it's the same thing mm -hmm. they they expect like oh i'm going to be vice president of the company it's like no you're not like well i think nobody cares what you think you're nothing right now right and you know this entire thing about virtue signaling for example for body positivity that's basically uh, that's basically aligned with a guy virtue signaling his poverty. There's yes. nothing cool about being poor. And so I had this conversation with uh, Greg Hurwitz, who is a good friend of Jordan Peterson's. He's, a, he's a, a writer. He's got 20 published novels. He wrote the Orphan X series, very accomplished. He writes Batman, mm. like, like the, the actual stuff for the Batman comics, like the actual, you know, what do you call it? The... I, I can't remember the words. Huh? Story no, line. like the actual comic books, like, yeah. like, like the stuff that's like the official storyline, yeah, yeah. right? The canon. The can yeah, he writes the canon material. And one of the things that uh, we were ta chatting about, he's a really bright guy. He was like, you know, we're, like, we're, we're heading towards bottom in society. He goes, but what is the bottom? Mm. Like, what is the actual bottom? And, and, I, and I kind of had thought about this question myself a little bit. Like, what is the bottom? I think the bottom is when the top aspiration is to race to the bottom. That's mm. the bottom. So, for example, right now it's about how, how, put, how, uh, <laughs> how segregated you are. It's like... How marginalized um, what was that marginalized? How marginalized? How, how, where you yeah. are in the victim? We're like literally racing to the at, we're a spy. It's like, whoa, you're that, but I'm also this. Yeah, but I'm also this, but I'm also yes. this. But it's and like calling someone privileged. Right. Is an insult. It's an insult. It's like so. Yesterday, somebody called me a classist, and I, and I was like, <laughs> and I was like, I've never heard it before. I'm like, thank you. Yeah. Like, thank you for acknowledging my hard work and my labor to get to here because I didn't have any what you think are privileges just because of the way that's like, well, you look like this and like that and all this. Like, dude, I grew up on eating at the food bank, bruv. Like, that's not something I experienced growing up yeah. because we immigrated from the Soviet Union, right? So to me, the bottom is exactly like, like I think we're in the bottom now because the bottom literally has no bottom. It's mm. just aspiring to be worse mm -hmm. in order to show people like, look at how shitty my life is and love me more. But there's nothing aspirational about that. No. And you know what's weird about it as well is it's weird that this is coinciding at the time where, look, if you live in the modern Western world, you live in the most peaceful Longest life expectancy, lowest chance of war, lowest chance of famine, uh, most economically prosperous by various measures, um, access to the greatest science and technology and medicine, access to the greatest pool of people and information at your fingertips and all, all of these things. So it, it's funny because the most, by definition, the most privileged people in the world, in, today. in human, us. in human history, right? Yeah. yeah. Us also have the biggest mentality, uh, victim mentality and, and chip on their shoulder in this race to the bottom. So it, it's very strange how these things are happening at the same time. I mean, if you just rewind, yeah. just rewind 100 years ago, just go back to 1923. 
okay? And you compare the life that we're living now in 2023 to how people were living in 1923. People, didn't have, people didn't have toilets in 1923. Yeah. Yeah. Like, think, people think didn't of, have phones in their house. They didn't have yeah. television sets back then. Yeah. They didn't have commercial use vehicles they, they that everybody could access they to. They didn't have antibiotics. Right. Right. There are times when if, if you were getting a surgery, do you know what they do? They get you drunk and they put a stick in your mouth to bite and they get people to physically pin you to a table while, they while they're open, cutting yeah. while they're so, on you. What was it like? The, the connection between the fact that <laughs> microbes caused disease was made in like 1860. Late 1800s. Yeah. Like just right there. And it's like, oh, surgeons learned their wash their hands before surgery like 80 years ago. Ignaz Semmelweis. And the guy who discovered that yeah. ended up dying in a mental institution and, and no, you know, nobody believed him. And so, and the, the other thing I, I would love to add to what you said is that it's all, and this is going to, this is the one thing I believe that offends a lot of people, but I know it's true. It's easier to make wealth today than yes. it's ever been. People like, young people, there's no opportunities, way more opportunities. Yes. Like, first of all, all information is free now. Yes. Like I had to go to the library to get a book to learn about a suit. Yep. Like, like now information is available free all the time and nobody's consuming it. Yeah. It's wild. I know people personally who have become millionaires in within a five year span from things that they learned from YouTube or things that they learned from Twitter and implemented. Yeah. Right. I know people who have gone from zero. They, they started a, a podcast or a YouTube channel or what. I also know people who have become millionaires off of each of these platforms. I know people who became millionaires off Twitter. Mm. I know people who become millionaires off YouTube. I know people who become millionaires off Facebook. I know people like just... And that's just social media. Mm. And it's just, it, it's crazy. It, we, we live in a, an interesting time because I, I feel like we live in the age of, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? Not, not oxymorons. What's the, uh, there is a word I'm looking for, right? I understand now. what you meant when you say oxymorons, right? Yeah, we, we, live in, we live in this world of, the world will come to me later. I can't okay, remember yeah, it right yeah. now. Someone will like be screaming it as they're listening. Um, let's say oxymorons, yeah. where things that seem to be at opposites are po simultaneously possibly, true. Possibly euphemisms. <laughs> yeah, it's not euphemisms. It's not the word I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. um, I can't think of it right yeah. now. Contradictions. Oh, okay, sure. We yeah. live in the age of contradictions, where it is simultaneously the economy is, the, the amount of opportunity globally is insane mm -hmm. higher than ever you've got the internet you have access to all this information people whatever at the same time if you're still running on the old model and old way of thinking it's actually harder mm. now than it was in the 90s 80s 70s 60s 50s to um earn a living it, it's weird like they're both true at the same time mm. we have the greatest access to information about nutrition we have the greatest access to food we have the best medicine, all of these things. Meanwhile, we live in one of the most unhealthy time periods. We have yeah, the yeah, highest yeah. level of obesity, rising diabetes, rising depression rates, rising you, rising anxiety, all the mental health problems, all of these things, despite all the comfort. People are not, if you were a young man growing up <laughs> in most centuries, you would have been worried about famine, right. worried about going to war, worried about uh, catching some type of disease that just takes you out, whatever it is. Now, it's, I mean, average person's not worrying about any of that stuff, yeah, yeah. but they can't control how much food they're eating. They can't control how much they're drinking. They can't control this well, and that. Well, you notice so. it's like humans were basically meant to be resilient, yeah. and everything we've built has reduced resiliency. Mm. And it's, uh, that's, that's the contradiction that I see. Maybe I'm not correct about it, yeah. but it's like, you know, and the other thing too is like you think about society before, men always had a rite of passage. Yes. And we don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the what what separates a boy from a man anymore? Nothing. Yeah. Age, a number. Yeah, a number. it's crazy, right? It's crazy. And then to add to it all, I mean, something that has something that has definitely gotten worse. And I, I think this is actually upstream. This is at the root of a lot of the problems. Mm. And this is the this is the breakdown of family. It's an yeah. un, it's an uncomfortable topic for a lot of people. It's hundred percent what it is. It, yeah. yeah. At la, we we have the highest percentage ever, as far as I yeah. know, at le least in recorded human history, uh, modern history of abs absent it's like, fathers, it's like 40, it's something like 40%, family breakdown, like 40 divorce. 40% single mother now in North Just, America or yeah, something? It's crazy. There, yeah, it, it's, it's crazy. You know, yeah. there's communities where it's 70% plus, right? Whereas if you have a father and you know your father, you're in the minority. And it makes people uncomfortable, but this is a massive problem. And one of the biggest issues with it is it's, it creates a feedback loop. Because people then come from that and then oftentimes they go and they carry on the dysfunction and it gets passed down. And what you're getting is an increasing pool of people 
who are growing up with the idea that all of this is normal or that it's all it's all fine or yeah. it's all good or whatever. You know, you don't really need. I've seen you see articles out there. Right? Oh, do, Look, do, that, do you really need a father? Do people that's really why need to we're in Dubai, isn't it? It is like societies that have. Uh, this is something that I went to like the art conference, and this is something that really a message that was sold very heavily, and I and I bought it. Let's put it this way, like. Older institutions, like even religious institutions, even if you're not a religious person, at the very least, they put a map to what a higher standard of living can be. Yes. And so at least you have an aim. And then you can compare yourself to that. Because if you don't have an aim, again, you just it just seems that we regress for the worse. Right? Yeah. And that's, that's what I realized like probably five, six years ago only. It's like the biggest privilege I had over really anyone is that my parents stayed together. Mm -hmm. Um, the entire time that I was a child through my adolescence, they stayed together, like just having parents that stayed together until I, you know, was until I was ready to move out of the house that my parents were together has made all the difference. Yeah, it's huge. You don't realize how big it is until you realize how many people don't have that and how in the different ways it impacts people all the way through adulthood. Mm. Right. Um, so I did want to ask, given that you're, I mean, you're the CEO of a company, you're traveling all the time, um, but you've also got a wife and you've got four kids. Yeah, so how sure. do you, how do you manage and yeah. balance that all? I because, actually had this conversation yeah. with Martin Ford, okay. the actor very recently, sure. because Martin is like, and he asked me the same question, but he was coming from a different place because, you know, he's been like a bouncer for like a large <laughs> part of his professional life and he's 40 now. Mm -hmm. And now he's become fairly famous and he's traveling all the time. Yes. And he's like, what do you do? And I said, what do you think I do? He goes, well, I'm, he's like, I'm not allowed to bring my wife and my kids on set, but I'm taking like RVs, like an RV and I'll just drive for like five days from like England down to like Italy mm -hmm. and it'll be a family experience. And I'm like, yeah, I just do the same thing. So I'm in Dubai right now. We were shooting this morning. I brought my wife with me yeah. and that's our, fa so this is our, I'm very proud to say like with several times this year where I've had a business trip and I had to go like three, four days, mm -hmm. that became a romantic weekend for me and okay, my wife. Right. So we will go like, you know, we have meetings on Monday, we'll go on Saturday yeah. and we'll spend Saturday and Sunday together. I'm taking notes here, by the way, because I'm sure. going to right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like decade. literally, I just like to incorporate. <laughs> and so about once or twice a year, like I'm, I'm really thankful. And by the way, this is not a brag. I'm really thankful for Dimitri in his 20s and I'm really thankful for Dimitri in his 30s. Yes. And I want to make sure that Dimitri in his 50s will be really thankful for Dimitri's. And like, I love 20s Dimitri. Yes. Like not a lot of people like 20s Dimitri. Mm. You know, a lot of people are like, <laughs> I, I mostly worked all the time in my 20s, mm -hmm. all the time. Like, like I was literally knocking on doors 12 hours a week, six, uh, 14 hours a day rather, 14 hours a day, six days a week. Yeah. Like I just, I would work every Saturday. And my wife, even that, when we we're dating in our 20s, I worked every Saturday mm -hmm. to see clients. Like, because I could make money on Saturday, so I made money on Saturday. Yeah. I love 20s Dimitri. Not a lot of people did. I worked all the time. I, I never drank. I didn't touch alcohol until I was like 37 like, to try what a beer tastes like. <laughs> you know, like I never drank. And now that I meet very successful people at the top, they were exactly the same. Mm. Like I just had this conversation with Henry, my video guys with me, Claudio Castanoli, he played Cesaro in the WWE. He's like a big wrestler. He still hasn't touched alcohol. Yeah. He's like 40 and he's in the best shape ever. Yeah. So alcohol is poison. There it is. Right. And so, and so I, I thankfully had both parents that taught me that. So I believed it. And so uh, I started to just, as I, as I grew and I realized how important it was, I started to incorporate my wife into more of my trips. And then mm -hmm. once or twice a year, like my kids, my it's most, my daughter's so funny. We're flying. I was last year, we're flying to Denmark for the Legoland. Okay. And she's like, daddy, have you ever been to Denmark? She's nine. She's eight back then. She's like eight. No, I've never been to Denmark. She's like, me neither. And I'm like, okay. She's like, but, you know, my favorite place is to go is Dubai. Like, it's where I like to travel. Yeah. And I'm like, you're eight. You shouldn't be saying that. <laughs> but but it's funny is because I brought my wife and kids all as a family to Dubai two or three times now. Okay. Because So I've just learned to incorporate. So this is something I learned early on when I started sales from a very, very successful salesperson. I was shadowing. It was a lady who was very, very good at this. And she said, look, um, life's like imagine a, a teeter-totter. Mm -hmm. like, like, you know, in the playground, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you could sit here near the middle in your work, like your, your, like your life is not very extreme. Mm. You're going to move it down very slowly. And then your social life sits here as well to balance it out. Yes. If you're living out here in the extreme in your professional life, make sure your social life is matching. Mm. So everything's extreme. So that, what that means is that if I have to do this and I do this uh, at a very high, you know, very high intensity, it means that my social life has to match the same intensity. Yes. So I can't necessarily be home every night with my wife and kids, but that is so important to me. Got you. So I just match with the intensity on the other end. I take my wife and kids to Dubai with me. This that. one we decided to do it like as a husband-wife thing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but also one other reason, it's not a, it's not a brag. I just, I, I hope somebody as a young man or woman listens to this because it's just been so helpful it's to me. It's mostly young men who listen to this podcast. Okay. It's been so helpful to me. Okay. I'm so thankful for Dimitri in his twenties because at 40, I'm not solving 20 year old problems. Yes. Like a lot of failure to me is very easily defined. Like people, how do you define failure? You're solving problems that are not, that are below your age. Mm. Like if I'm 20 or if I'm 40 and I'm starting a new career at 40, that's a 20 year old problem. Gotcha. But at 20, I was solving 20 year old problems. Gotcha. At 30, I was traveling around training my salespeople all the time. Now as a CEO, most of my work is done with a couple of calls a day and a few decisions a week that are high level decisions, but they're very impactful. And I know how to make it very quickly and very accurately because I've gone through tens and twenties of thousands of iterations in those decisions to understand the decision, what's right or wrong when the decision's not so clear. Yeah. Because a lot of times in like, let's say leadership or building a company, People come to you with questions that are very, very nuanced and difficult questions, and you just won't know how to answer it unless you've freaking done it a thousand times. Yep. That makes sense? Yep. So I'm thankful for 20s Dimitri because he gave me an opportunity at 40 to be solving problems that are maybe a little bit above my age. Mm. Makes sense? I love that, man. And, and this is coming back to Jordan Peterson. Like, you do more than what you're paid for, and invisible doors will open, and you just have to trust in the invisible doors. Bars, man. That's actually one of the chapters of my upcoming book. Mm make decisions that your future self will thank you for and not resent mm. you for. Mm. Yeah, Man, Dimitri, it's been awesome to talk to you. Uh, we could go on for ages. We will definitely do another podcast in the future, but where can people find and follow you online? Yeah, so lgfg.com. It's like look, good, feel. By the way, that tells you when I, how old I was when I started the company. I need, I need a name for a luxury brand. I called it look, good, feel, good. It's <laughs> dumb as hell, but it freaking works, right? <laughs> LGFG. So like look, good, feel, good, lgfg.com. And you can find LGFG, like just type in LGFG on social media and you'll find us.